seven. Susan took us back to see Dr. Graham. I can't believe it's the same children, he said. Jamie was two inches taller and I was three. We were heavier, too, and I'd grow strong from riding and helping Fred. With my crutches, I could walk for ages without getting tired. We didn't have impedigo or lice or scabs on our legs or anything. We were the picture of health, he said. Then he took my bad foot and wriggled it. Still nothing, he asked Susan. She shook her head. I've invited her to visit for Christmas, she said. If she comes, I hope to convince her. Who? asked Jamie. Never you mind, Susan replied. I was hardly paying attention. My mind always wandered into its own corner when strangers touched me. Susan tapped my shoulder. Does this hurt? she asked. I shook my head. My foot hurt. It always did, but Dr. Graham wriggling it didn't make it hurt worse. I just didn't like it. If perhaps you could do this every day, he said, twisting my foot as though unringing a cloth, as though he could make it look more normal. If she could gain some flexibility, that would only be a help for later on. Special shoes, I said, my mind coming back to me. Fred said club foot horses had special shoes. Dr. Graham let go of my foot. That won't be enough at this stage, he said. I'm convinced you'll require surgical intervention. Oh, I said, not having any idea what he meant. Still, he said, massage might help and certainly can do no harm. It turned out that he meant Miss Smith was going to rub and tug my foot every night. We had already switched to reading Swiss Family Robinson in the blacked out living room after dinner, snug by the coal fire that didn't require that didn't quite heat our bedrooms upstairs. Now Susan sat on one edge of the sofa nearest the lamp, while I sat on the other and stretched my feet into her lap. Jamie and his cat lay by the fire on the rug. Your foot is so cold, Susan said the first evening. Doesn't it feel cold? I nodded. We were still keeping it bandaged, but the bandage tended to get damp and my foot was nearly always freezing. I don't mind, I said. When it gets numb, I can't feel it. Susan looked at me puzzled. I said, when it gets numb, it doesn't hurt. She winced. You could get frostbite, she said. That wouldn't be good for you. We need a better plan. In typical Susan fashion, she set about making one. First, she took one of her own thick wool stockings, which were bigger than mine and easier to slide over my inflexible angle, ankle. Then she messed around with an old pair of slippers and a needle and thread, and pretty soon I had a sort of house shoe with a leather bottom and a knit top. It didn't keep my foot completely dry, but it helped a lot. Hmm, Susan said, studying the shoe. We'll keep working. She had her sewing machine going all the time now, three or four hours a day. She made bed jackets for soldiers from cloth the, the WVS gave her. She made a coat for Jamie out of an old woolen coat she had ha said had been Becky's. She went through a pile of old clothes and ripped them apart at the seams, then washed and pressed the cloth pieces and cut and sewed them into different things entirely. The government calls, make do and mend, Susan said. I call it how I was raised. My mother was an excellent manager. Does your mother hate you? I asked. Her face clouded. No, she's dead, remember? Did she hate you when you were alive? When she was alive? I hope not, Susan said. But she said your father doesn't like you. No, he thinks my going to university was a bad idea. Did your mother think that? I don't know, Susan said. She always did whatever my father wanted. She stopped pinning pieces of cloth together. It wasn't a good thing, she said. It made her unhappy, but she did it anyway. But you didn't do what your father wanted, I said. It's complicated, Susan said. At first he was pleased when I won a place at Oxford, only later he said he didn't like the way it changed me. He thought all women should get married, and I didn't do that, and it's complicated. Only I'm not sorry I made the choices I did. If I had to do it over, I'd make them again. Susan made Jamie a pair of nice shorts to wear to church out of the old tweed skirt that had once been Becky's. She recut the jacket that had gone with the skirt and turned it into a short, heavy coat I could wear when I was riding. Since the day I broke Susan's sewing machine, I'd refused to touch it, but Susan started to teach me how to sew by hand. She said it was better to learn that way first, anyhow. She showed me how to sew buttons, and I sewed the buttons onto all the bed jackets she made in my jacket and the flap on Jamie's shorts. At the WVS meeting, she told the other women that I had helped her. She said so when she came home. One day, she rummaged around in her bedroom and came out with an armful of woolen, wool yarn. She got out wooden sticks. She looped the yarn around the sticks and pretty soon had made some warm hats for Jamie and me and mufflers and mittens to keep our hands warm. My mittens looked like they had two thumbs apiece. Susan showed me how one thumb part went over my thumb and the other went over my littlest finger. She had taken very thin scraps of leather and sewed them across the palms. They're riding mittens, she said, watching my face. See? I saw. When I first started riding buttered, I held the reins in my fists, but Fred insisted I do it the proper way, threading them through my third and fourth fingers and out over my thumb. In these mittens, I could hold the reins right and the leather straps would keep the yarn from wearing away. I made them up, Susan said. They were all my own idea. Do you like them? It was one of those times when I knew the answer she wanted from me, but I didn't want to give it. They're okay, I said, and then relenting a little. Thank you. Sour push, she said, laughing. Would it kill you to be grateful? Maybe. Who knew? The vicar came over on a Saturday with a gang of boys and built an Anderson shelter in the back garden for us. Anderson shelters were little tin huts that were supposed to be safe from bombs. 
Ours didn't look safe. It looked small and dark and flimsy. The bottom half of it was buried in the ground, and you had to go down three steps to open the little door. Inside, there was just room for two long benches facing each other. Susan said we wouldn't have been able to dig the hole ourselves, not if we worked all week on it. She took drinks out to the vicar and said so. The vicar, sweating in his shirt sleeve, said it was his pleasure. They'd been putting up Anderson shelters all over the village. It was good work for the boys. Some of the boys were evacuees and some weren't. One was Stephen White. He grinned and rested his shovel when I went over to him. So you're not busy every day, he asked. I am busy, I said. I ride. I help Fred Grimes. I do things. I just meant, you said you were too busy to come to tea. He used a dirty hand to push his hair away from his face and left a smear of mud on his cheek. Still, like me, he looked better than he had in London. His clothes were neat and clean, and he was taller. Something about his grin made me feel I could trust him. I wouldn't know what to do at tea, I said. He shrugged. Sure you do, but you have tea every night. But that colonel, he's an old ducks he is. You'd like him once you got to know him. How come you, don't, you didn't go home with the rest of your family? I'd been wanting to ask for ages. Stephen looked uncomfortable. The colonel's mostly blind, he said. You've seen him, and he's got no family. When I first got here, he was really feeble. A bunch of the food he'd been eating had gone bad, only using, only he's lost his sense of taste, too, so he couldn't tell. And so it made him sick, and his house was just awful, bugs everywhere and rats, and he couldn't fix any of it. I cleaned the place up. The vicar's wife taught me to cook, just easy things. And she brings us food sometimes, too. She's nice. And I read to the colonel, and he likes that. He's got piles of books. Stephen picked his shovel back up and started heaving dirt onto the top of the shelter. Mum's after me to come home. I'd like to go. I miss home, I do. But if I leave, the colonel will die. He really will. He's got no one. Stephen looked around the muddy garden at the house, stable, and butters filled. Pretty nice place here. Yes. Your mam ain't come for you? No, she doesn't want us. He nodded. Just as well. She shouldn't have shut you up like she did. I shivered as the wind whipped higher. It was because of my foot. Stephen shook his head. Foot's the same, isn't it? He said. And you're not shut up now. Come to tea sometime. The colonel likes having visitors. When everyone had gone, I stood outside the door of the shelter. I didn't like it. It was dark and damp and cold. It smelled like ma'am's cupboard beneath the sink. Goosebumps rose on my arms and my stomach churned. I didn't go inside. Susan stocked the shelter with blankets, bottles of water, candles, and matches. She said air raid sirens would go off if enemy planes were coming to bomb us. We would hear the sirens and run into the shelter and be safe. What about Bovril? Jamie asked anxiously. Bavro could come into the shelter. Susan found an old basket with a lid on it and put it in the shelter. If Bavro was scared, Jamie could shut him in the basket. He won't be scared, Jamie said. He's never scared. Butter wouldn't fit in the shelter. Chapter 28 It was cold now and dark came early. The color had leached out of the grass in Butter's field and he started to grow thin. When I showed this to Susan, she sighed. It's all the exercise you're giving him, she said. He used to be fat enough he could winter over on grass. She bought hay, and we stacked it in one of the empty stalls. She bought a bag of oats, too. Every day I took Butter three or four flakes of hay and a butter of grain, a bucket of grain. He still lived outside. Fred said it was healthier for him as well as being less work for us. Back when the leaves had first started changing colors on the trees, I'd been alarmed. Susan promised that it happened every year. The leaves changed color and fell off, and the trees would look dead all winter, but they wouldn't actually be dead. In spring, they'd grow new green leaves again. Susan had gotten over being surprised at all the things we didn't know. When she showed me how to cook or sew something, she always started at the very beginning. This is a needle. Look, it has a little hole on one end for the thread to loop through and a point on the other end so it can go into the cloth. Or, eggs have a clear part called the white and a yellow part called the yolk. You break an egg by tapping it on the edge of the table and then cracking it open with your hands only over the bowl like this. Susan said winter usually made her feel sad and gloomy, the way she was when we first came. This winter, though, she was almost too busy to be sad, she had to shop and cook and clean and do the wash. She was particular about the wash, and sew and go to meetings. But as the days grew shorter, she did seem sad. She made an effort for us, but you could tell it was an effort. She was always tired. I tried to be helpful. I cooked and sewed buttons. I went with her to the shops. I learned to hem bed jackets. Meanwhile, I still helped Fred twice a week, and I rode butter every day. On a rainy, cold Wednesday afternoon, Susan sat slumped in her chair. I had finished washing the lunch dishes. Jamie had gone to school. The fire was burning low. So I added coal and poked it up a little bit. Thank you, Susan murmured. She looked frail and shivery. She spilled a bit of potato from lunch down the front of her blouse and not scrubbed it clean, which wasn't like her. I didn't want her staying in bed all day again. I sat on the sofa and looked at her, and I said, Maybe you could show me how to read. She looked up disinterestedly. Now? I shrugged. She sighed, Oh, very well. We went to the kitchen table, and she got out a pencil and paper. 
all the world's words in the world are made up of just 26 letters, she said there's a big and a little version of each. She wrote the letters out on the page and named them all. Then she went through them again. Then she told me to copy them onto another piece of paper, and then she went back to her chair. I stared at the paper. I said, this isn't reading, this is drawing. Writing, she corrected. It's like buttons and hymns. You've got to learn those before you can sew in the machine. You've got to know your letters before you can read. I suppose so, but it was boring. When I said so, she got up again and wrote something along the bottom of the paper. What's that, I asked. Ada is a Kermadegan. Kermadegan? She said. Ada is a Kermadegan, I guess. I copied at the end of my alphabet. It pleased me. After that, with help from Jamie, I left Susan little notes every day. Susan is a big frog. That one made Jamie giggle. Butter is the best pony ever. Jamie sings like a squirrel. And then some papers I kept because they were useful and I could put them on the kitchen table whenever I needed to leave Susan a message. It made her happier when she knew where we were. Ada is at Fred's. Ada is riding butter. Jamie went to the airfield. He wasn't supposed to, but he did. They'd gotten so used to him sneaking in from under the fence that they hardly bothered to scold him anymore. Only if they say I have to leave, I have to leave right away, Jamie told us. If they don't say so, I can stay and talk to them. Planes fascinated him. He made friends with the pilots and they let him sit inside the Spitfires when they were parked on the field. Susan asked us how we usually celebrated Christmas. We didn't know what to say. Christmas was a big day at the pub, so ma'am always worked. She'd get lots of tips, and usually we'd have something good to eat, fish and chips or a meat pie. Do you hang up your stockings? Susan asked. Jamie frowned. What for? We'd heard of Father Christmas. It was something other children talked about, but we didn't get visits from him. I said, what do you usually do? Her face went soft, remembering. The Christmases when Becky was alive, we'd have a big dinner with some of our friends, she said. Roast goose or turkey. In the morning, we'd exchange presents. We always had a little tree, and we'd decorate the windowsills with holly. And then we'd have something wonderful for breakfast. Hot sticky buns and bacon and coffee. And then we'd just laze around until it was time to start making dinner. On Boxing Day, Becky would go hunting. When I was little, my family all went to midnight services on Christmas Eve. My father would preach. The church always looked beautiful in the cold candlelight. Then I'd go to sleep, such a short sleep, and wake up in my stocking filled with little presents at the foot of my bed. The bigger gifts were downstairs under the tree. Mother cooked a huge meal and all the aunts and uncles and cousins came. Her voice trailed away. We'll do something nice, she said, for your first Christmas here. Can ma'am come? Jamie asked. Susan put her hand on his head. I hope she will, she said. I've invited her, but I haven't gotten a reply. I'll write to her, Jamie said. You don't have to, I told him. It seemed risky. If we reminded ma'am that we were here, would she come and get us? We need to talk to her about your foot, Susan said. Well, I'm not writing, I said. I had memorized the alphabet and was starting to understand how the letters should sound so that I could read even words I hadn't seen before. I could write a bit, but not to ma'am. You don't have to, Susan said, her arm around me. The shop's filled with the most amazing things. Oranges and nuts and all sorts of candies and toys. Susan said people were determined to have a happy Christmas despite the war. She herself ordered a goose since Jamie and I had never had one, and then she invited some of the pilots from the airfield to come and eat it with us because the goose was too big for the three of us alone. I invited Fred, but he said he always went to his brother's house and he didn't like to break tradition. Thank you kindly, he added. So I invited Maggie. It seemed right to me that if Jamie got to have pilots, I should have a friend to dinner, too. Besides, Fred and maybe Stephen and Maggie were the only friend I had. She came back from school the week before Christmas. We rode together up the big hill where the wind was blowing hard and we could see down the barricaded beach. Maggie was different, stiffer and more standoffish than she'd been on the day I rode her home. She looked elegant on her pony with her leather gloves and her little velvet cap. I put my hand up to shield my eyes. Riding up the hill had been my idea. I always check for spies when I'm up here, I said. We're supposed to, you know. We were told so by the government men on the radio. Nazi spies could be dressed as nurses or nuns or anything. I know, Maggie said crossly. I'm not stupid. Then she added, why didn't you write me back? I asked you to. I hadn't known she'd asked me. Fred hadn't read that part of her letter. And while I had another couple of goes at reading it, Maggie's handwriting was curly with the letters that run together. I couldn't make out the words. I was ashamed to admit this. I've been very busy, I said. She flashed me a look of hurt and anger. I understood suddenly that she'd been waiting for me to write back, waiting and hoping for a letter. I didn't know she felt that way about me. I took a deep breath. I'm just now learning to write, I said, and read. So I couldn't write back yet. I'm sorry. Next time I'll try. Instead of looking horrified by my ignorance, she looked mollified. Susan taught me that word, and I loved it. Mollified. Sometimes when Jamie was cross, he had to be mollified. I didn't think of that, she said. I thought you just weren't interested. Why wouldn't Miss Smith have helped you? She would have written down what you wanted to say. She would have if I'd asked. I didn't want to ask her. I don't like her helping me. Why ever not? 
I don't want to get used to her, I said. She's just someone we have to stay with for a little while. She's not, you know, actually real. Maggie looked me up and down. She seems real to me, she said. I saw you the day you got off that train. You looked like you'd already been through a war. Then you looked better than the day you helped me. And now, side saddle on a pony and fancy clothes and not so skinny your bones show. Your eyes are different, too. Before, you looked scared to death. I didn't want to talk about it. There weren't any spies in view, nor any ships, and Butter was tired of standing in the wind. Race you to the village, I said. 